Okay, we want to continue our discussion of uniqueness and stability. Remember last time that we we defined a stable material as um, one that work hardens, and we we began with uh, basically Drucker's postulate, which is that uh, the increment of stress times the increment of strain being uh, greater than or equal to zero. And then we develop some relations from that, specifically that the the um, net stress work and the net complementary stress work were were both uh, uh, positive semi-definite or greater than or equal to zero. So, and also what we found that that did was it, it excluded any sort of strain softening materials. So now we're going to talk about another uh, postulate uh, and it's going to exclude another class of materials. So uh, let's just say that um, previously uh, we excluded materials with a negative tangent modulus or, or those materials that strain soften. And if we're talking about what kind of materials did we eliminate, um, we eliminated materials that might display um, some of that strain softening behavior, uh, like uh, concrete, for example. So we eliminated uh, concrete for the most part, um, and uh, things like ice would be another example. Okay. So now we want to eliminate materials that appear to st stiffen upon loading. So not that harden, but actually appear to stiffen, okay? So we eliminate materials uh, that stiffen upon loading. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's draw a stress strain curve. So here we go. Same as before, this is some epsilon ij. I'm representing it in one or in two dimensions here, uh, really just uh, one dimension of stress, one dimension of strain, just for illustration. The material is going to load up, and then this would be, let's say, our typical strain hardening material that we had denoted previously as A. And now we want to look at what about a material that, that stiffens as we go up. We'll call that material C. Okay, so. Um, so let's let's say that curve C um, uh, is typical of a couple types of materials. Um, let's think about what that might be. What would cause a stiffening? Well, the the easiest way to think of it is something maybe is becoming denser as we as we apply a load to it. Um, so that uh, think about maybe like um, uh, porous materials that might have pore collapse or or something like that. So this is typical of uh, porous aluminum would be an example, uh, or maybe snow, right? Because there's nothing we could. Um, again, it's it's uh, obviously in tension. That's not the case, but in compression, it would stiffen like this. Okay. The key feature here is that for our our postulates that we talked about previously, both. Uh, a and C uh, will satisfy the postulate one that we developed from the previous lecture. But uh, for the purposes of this class, we want to eliminate uh, the, the material behavior shown by C. So what we want to do to, to think about how, how we can do that is consider a stress cycle. And the stress cycle uh, is going to go from uh, some value sigma A up to sigma B, and then back down to sigma A. Okay, so there's our stress cycle. Now let's look at what that's going to look like uh, up here on our plot. Let's let's choose. Um, uh, let's say uh, this quantity here. Let's say that's sigma A. And let's go ahead and say that this location up here, well, that's sigma b. So I can sort of draw my intersecting lines. And the same thing here. I'm going to keep going. And then we have this initial elastic modulus of e. OK? OK, so the, the, the um, 
path that we're going to take, let's say for material A, we're going to start at sigma A down here and we're going to ramp up to sigma B. So along A, that's going to look like this red curve. And then if we drop back down to, to uh, sigma A, it's going to unload elastically, just like that, right, where this is the elastic modulus, okay? Okay, so how about the case for C? Well, C is going to start at the same location, except it's going to ramp up to there. And then on unloading, it's going to, it's going to unload along the elastic modulus. So it's actually going to come down here, right? So let's call this, this curve here C1 and this side C2. So it unloads this way and loads up this way, okay? And uh, let me also label A1 and A2 for you. So in this case, we'll load up, load back down. We'll call this curve A1 and then this curve A2. Okay, so now let's think about what the complementary work is uh, in this case. So the complementary work Uh, is going to be given by, now we're going to integrate over this cycle, and the complementary work is going to be epsilon ij times d sigma ij, right? That's the definition of complementary work. That's going to be equal to, we basically have two paths we care about. So along path one, we'll go up from sigma ij a up to sigma ij b of uh, epsilon ij, and I'm going to put a superscript here of 1 just to remind you that that's along path 1. That's, of course, going to be d sigma ij. Then it's going to be plus the integral from, now it's going to go back down, sigma ij b to sigma ij a. And I'm going to show here, this is epsilon ij and this is path 2, whether it's a or b, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then d sigma ij. Okay? So we can simplify this integral, um, just noting that we can switch the order of integration and then we, we obviously make this negative, but then we can bring it all under the same integral. So we can integrate, this, this is the integral from sigma ij a up to sigma ij b. Now times the quantity epsilon ij one minus epsilon ij two, right? And we'll go say that's still times d sigma ij. Okay, so we have two conditions here. So we'll say, what, what does it look like for curve A? Okay, and then we'll also ask the question, how about for curve B, for curve C? Okay, and what we want to try to evaluate is what is, for curve A, what's epsilon ij1 minus epsilon ij2? Um, and then the same thing here. Okay, so let's let's just scroll back up and at and and uh, look at what that gives us. So here's our picture, and at, so here's epsilon ij one. So here's on the load up. This is one, and this is two. So the strain on for a at least the strain at two is is always larger than this, the strain at one, right? And that's true for anywhere, if we take a take anywhere along this stress value and go across the, the curve here, we can see that the strain is lower on one than it is on two, okay? So what does that mean? If I go down to here and I ask, well, if it's lower on one and larger on two, then this quantity is gonna be always less than or equal to zero. Okay, so if I integrate a always negative quantity, then that quantity will always be negative. So in that case, the integral of epsilon ij d sigma ij will be less than or equal to zero. Okay, now let's go do the same thing for curve C. Okay, so for curve C, it's the opposite effect, right? The unload C2 curve uh, is actually going to show a, a larger, uh, sorry, a smaller strain than the, the loading curve. And so that sign flips, right? So this, 
This now becomes greater than or equal to zero. And so we have a distinguishing feature that, that uh, delineates these materials. So d epsilon ij, d sigma ij now greater than or equal to zero. And so our postulate two is that we're going to select curve A, basically. So postulate number two. Uh, <clears throat> so for an inelastic material, or this, in this case it's plastic, subjected to a stress cycle, okay, the complementary uh, stress work uh, is negative semi-definite. Okay, so remember that's less than or equal to zero. That's what that means. So the equation that we care about then is the integral uh, along the path of epsilon ij d sigma ij uh, is going to be less than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's our second postulate. Um, we're going to specifically use the second postulate to develop some relationships for, uh, for uh, yield surfaces and, some, and try to understand some of the characteristics of yield surfaces uh, that arise from this.